with that. <laughs> Thanks so much. All right, so, I, so we're on, right? Yep. Well, good morning, everybody. Good morning, uh, gentlemen. I appreciate you joining us. We've, I'm going to just turn this over very quickly. I'm Nat Tupper, the Yarmouth Town Manager. I'm going to turn this over very quickly to Byron Rupp, who is the Interim Project Manager for the Army Corps of Engineers. Uh, working on the uh, Royal River study for the town of Yarmouth and all of its, all the Royal River constituents. And uh, we've been waiting for quite a while to get the first major task, which is the, the model of the river, the hydrology and hydraulics model done. And I want to present that in a little progress report and explore um, what the next steps are so that the community can, can kind of buckle up and get ready to take a ride together. So with that, I, I, if I ask that uh, just turn it over to Byron and maybe we just want to do introductions for the audience and, and each other because some of you know each other, but uh, most of you I've never seen in, in the flesh. <laughs> All right, thanks, Nat. Appreciate it. Again, thanks for the invite to speak uh, on, this, on this exciting study. Um, again, recognize it's been a while since uh, you know, we started this. We have had some turnover at the Corps, as Nat mentioned, I'm the interim PM. I'm actually a, a section chief at the Army Corps in the plan formulation branch. Um, we have identified a new project manager and I'll, we'll be introducing her to the public here in the next uh, weeks and months as we as we, we move this study forward. Um, again, uh, my background, Byron Rupp, I'm a section chief, uh, Corps Corp of Engineers. Our office is located in Concord, Massachusetts, but we cover all six uh, New England districts, six states in New England. Um, my background's in geology, so this, there's a lot of interesting stuff with this study in particular that um, you know, goes into my background, uh, technical background. Um, I'm also uh, presenting here today with Tom Milbacher, who's actually doing most of the work on this so, uh, since the study started. He's a, uh, Tom will kick it over to you. And then after you, Tom, I'll pass it down to Matt, Curtis, and, and Sean for, for intros. So Tom, just a quick intro. Great, thank you. Yes, uh, so uh, as Byron said, I'm Tom Milbachler. Uh, I've been with the New England District for about five years now. Um, I work in the water management section in the engineering division, uh, primarily doing hydraulic and hydrologic um, analyses. Um, prior to that, um, I had been working in private consulting for the first half of my career, primarily doing uh, female flood studies and other sorts of water management as well. Um, so uh, uh, as Byron said, I'm happy to be working on this and I'll pass it on to others. Thank you. Matt, why don't you go ahead? Oh, well, okay, sure. Uh, yeah, my name's Matt Bernier. I'm a civil and environmental engineer with the NOAA Restoration Center. Um, some of you might know uh, my colleague, Eric Hutchins, who's been involved um, in Royal River discussions in the past. Um, given this presentation and my um, prior life uh, working on a lot of hydraulic modeling and so on, um, Eric suggested that I uh, join, join this project. So happy to be on board. Sean. Yeah, my name's Sean Tui. I'm a project manager for Proc Marine Company. Um, Proc has completed most of the private dredging for the marinas um, in the river, I believe last in 2017. So uh, yeah, I'm kind of, uh, my background is marine construction, um, piers, pile driving, dredging, that kind of thing. You're, uh, you're a civil engineer as well, right? I am a civil engineer by education. Yep. And uh, and I know the, uh, Proc was uh, part of the construction team the last time we did a federal dredge right. in the river. So, uh, yep. so, well, then we'll turn it over to Curtis and thank you, Sean, for joining us. Uh, good morning. I'm Curtis Boland. I'm the director of the Casco Bay Estuary Partnership. Uh, the partnership um, works on a lot of different kinds of habitat and coastal restoration work. Um, one of the areas we work on regularly is um, river continuity and fish passage work. Uh, so we've got a lot of uh, background thinking about how do we uh, get uh, fish past various kinds of barriers. Mostly we work on road systems. We've been following work on the Royal River for a long time now, Nat. Uh, what is it, a decade? More than a decade. 
Um, we've been following, we've been assisting with getting some of the studies that are in the history on this, this project um, done. So, um, and just for uh, transparency, um, I am also serve on the board of Maine Rivers. Um, I'm not wearing that hat here today, but I don't want anybody to think I'm trying to hide that relationship either. So thanks. Thank you. Glad to have you guys helping out. I think it's back to you, Byron. All right. Hey, just a quick question. I'm getting some messages from some of the folks at the core um, who wanted to listen in today. Are, are, um, are they able to join in with that link you sent me? Or is there be a another link? link? You have, there's a panelist link that was emailed to you, and then there's a public link. Uh, um, gotcha. So they, can, so they can join in the audience. Oh, um, that, sorry, if Byron. You if you can send me their emails, um, I can make sure if you want them promoted to the panelists, um, I can just promote them if they join with the original link that we sent out to you guys and the audience. Got you. Could you just email me that original link quick? Absolutely. Actually, if you don't mind just emailing it to Tom, because I'm starting the presentation and yep. Tom can, can update everybody else. Um, Absolutely. That'd be awesome. All right, cool. Yeah. yeah, we have just so people people know, um, we got a bunch of uh, other core team members who wanted to listen in today um, as well. So I think I sent them the panelist link. Um, so they're not able to access. All right, great. All right, let's jump right into the presentation here. Um, so Overall, we're gonna we're gonna give a presentation. We're figuring it's gonna be about 30 minutes. I'm gonna go through some of the background of the study, uh, the study area, and then pull it over to, to uh, Tom, who's gonna show you some of the great modeling work that he's been working on there. And then we'll conclude with next steps and, and then have some have some time, hopefully about 20 minutes or so for discussion at the end. So I'll jump right into this here. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so what's the purpose of the study? So the purpose of the study is under the core section 206 authority. It's aquatic ecosystem restoration. And what we're looking at here is restoring a natural uh, fish passage on the Royal River. Um, we've got two bridges that we're looking at uh, within the system, the Bridge Street Dam and the, and the East Elm Street Dam, um, both of which have non-functioning fishways. I think both were built roughly in the 70s or so. and, and uh, there's was obviously many decades of interest in restoring fish passage there, but it has been unsuccessful thus far. So we are looking at alternatives um, to restore the fish passage along the river. So we always, at, at the core, we always look at a no action alternative and which we use to compare other plans against for existing and future conditions. So some of the alternatives that we're potentially gonna look at and we need to, you know, finalize this in a project management plan, but we are looking at the dam uh, dam removal, uh, a partial removal option or modification of existing structures or potentially new fish passage structures. So we're kind of going in that order now. The modeling work right now that we're looking at was focusing on the option, the most, I would say the most extreme option, which is complete removal of the dam um, and existing uh, fish passage ways. So next slide. So I know some of you have seen these slides too. I just want to recognize that. I just wanted to kind of set the background uh, for those who may not be familiar with the study and some of the background. Um, so some of you may have seen these slides, some of these slides presented by uh, Christine Reed uh, previously, who, who um, uh, took another position in the federal government uh, about six months ago. Okay, so looking at the Royal River system here, um, as mentioned, we got two man-made barriers that are primary focus right now for the study, the, the Bridge Street Dam and the Elm Street Dam. Long history of manufacturing at the Royal River, taking advantage of that, that uh, energy from the river to uh, power mills and such for grain, paper, textiles, lumber, lots of history uh, in the watershed. Uh, some of that history does influence some of the sediment uh, quality. We'll, we'll, we'll talk about that later in the, in the, in the project. Next slide. Okay, just a quick overview of existing core projects and studies in the area. So the red area is our uh, federal navigation project. So that project uh, has an access channel and a, a mooring area there um, to support 
uh, marine operations within the uh, Royal River uh, Basin. There's also um, a marsh area you see highlighted in yellow. That was a, was a marsh project that the Corps was involved with many years ago. Uh, going up upstream, the first point of interest is the Lower Falls, which is a natural rapids that's in the vicinity of some historical mill buildings and there's some historical foundation structures there and such. Uh, going upstream, Bridge Street Dam. Uh, next, next area here, I believe is Middle Falls. And then finally, we got the East Elm Dam uh, and the uppermost area. So we're not just looking at this little area, we're looking at it from a system context. We're looking at the watershed in its entirety. That's how the Corps does planning. We must have watershed based uh, focus and uh, analyses when we do uh, any of our civil works uh, planning efforts. Next slide. Okay, just to hone in here a little bit on the um, Bridge Street Dam, you can see the fish passage structure built in the 70s, they're highlighted uh, in yellow. Uh, next slide. And then the uppermost, the Elm Street uh, Bridge, we have the uh, fish passage structure there, also highlighted in yellow. Next slide. Okay, so planning considerations. This is a pretty busy slide, but it kind of gives you uh, a view of where we are, uh, big picture with the planning analysis. So we're looking at potentially removing both of those dams. Um, we want to have, if, if the, the most extreme dam removal doesn't look feasible, we would look at, we would kind of uh, downgrade from there, scale it accordingly. So looking at a partial removal or a modification of the existing structures. And then the last option could potentially be looking at brand new fish facet structures that are properly engineered to move uh, the target species um, upstream. So major considerations that have been identified coming out of the gate here. Uh, obviously, there's a lot of uh, removing a dam from any system is, isn't a trivial effort. There's a lot of work that needs to be put into looking at the second, third order effects of dam removal. Um, some of the primary effects that we looked at in Tom's model here, he'll get into detail. We looked at scour potential. So if we remove the dams, what does that do to, what happens when you restore the natural flow of the river? What kind of issues could we anticipate with, you know, erosion of uh, structures along the banks of the river? Primary, one of the primary um, concerns in that area was the, was the uh, interstate bridge down, downstream, the bridge abutments. Um, I think that's uh, I-295. Um, secondly, flooding. You remove the dams. What kind of issues could you see potentially with inducing flooding throughout the, the downstream of the dams? So are we setting up a situation where, say, you get a 100-year uh, or 1% annual chance exceedance uh, rain event? Are you looking at causing some flooding that would not have been there if the dams had been, you know, were in place? So we're, we took a look at that, and Tom will, Tom has some has some nice graphics to to show that uh, loss of recreation opportunities. So upstream uh, of the upper watershed area, um, upstream of uh, Elm Street Bridge, there's a, a pretty long uh, reach that is used heavily for uh, recreational purposes uh, within the town. We're talking uh, uh, fishing, boating, even winter skating, and and such. So we're, we're, we're aware of that. Lots of his, historical archeological site, sites. As noted, there's history going back to the 1600s in the area. So part of our study is actually looking at all of the uh, historic and uh, coordination with the shippos and the tippos and looking at all the historical um, uh, elements within the, within the watershed and looking at existing and future conditions with various alternatives in place. Um, so the other big thing too, and this is, I know that there's folks on the line here very concerned about this piece too, is what sort of impacts could there, could we see uh, to the Nav federal navigation project downstream if the dams were removed? So there is some sediment built up behind the dams. We'll talk about volumes and, and, and those sort of issues in Tom's portion, but we're very much aware of those concerns and that people make their livelihoods using that federal navigation project. There's several marinas um, that are that are very active in the area, and the concern is uh, 
re regarding a, a release a large volume of material that could be potentially contaminated into the, that channel, what kind of impacts are, would that have? Not just to the to the economy of the area, but also the the the, the uh, ecosystem. So all those things are are being uh, are being analyzed by the team. And uh, coming out of the gates, though, the first phase, if you will, of the project, um, I think that was. I think we're going to you next, Tom. Right? If you go to the next slide, just kind of yes, bridge the gap here. So. The way that we rolled out this study in coordination with 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 the town was in phases a phased approach we're in phase one there's several tasks key tasks in phase one and the first task was this modeling effort we wanted to get the modeling completed to the point it's it's not perfect but it's it's uh, refined enough to have a good conversation with folks and talk about next steps which is where we are here today but we really want to um you know take that modeling um make some, we, we do want to make some more improvements to the modeling uh, coming up, but we can have a discussion now about, are we, are we, it's a partnership between the town and the federal government, the Army Corps, these studies are a partnership, a 50-50 cost share partnership, is, are we in agreement to move forward with the study? That's something that we hope we could get to at the end of this call today. Um, we think we, we have enough information to move forward. Um, you know, I think you'll see from Tom's modeling that there is uh, good reason and plenty of uh, opportunity to, to move forward with the, with, with the study. So I think without further ado here, we'll go pass it over to Tom and he can go into detail on the modeling and, um, and then we'll talk about next steps and open up for questions. Go ahead, Tom. Awesome, thank you, Byron. Um, okay, so the, uh, the Royal River watershed uh, is uh, displayed here on the screen um, on the left side you can see uh, the it with an aerial view and can see that it's predominantly uh, predominantly undeveloped. The modeling reach that we're looking at is generally shown here um, with these cross sections um, and the, the blue line. And you also see that then here on the right side, uh, demonstrating the watershed over a terrain map. So the Royal River drains an area of 143 square miles um, and flows predominantly north to south from headwaters near Sabbath Day Lake to the Atlantic Ocean in the Gulf of Maine. There is a USGS stream gauge um, on the main stem uh, down near the mouth at the head of tide just uh, upstream of the lower falls. Uh, it's been collecting stream data um, from 1949 uh, to 2000 and uh, to currently, um, but there was the gap from 2004 um, until 2019. Um, so as part of our analysis, we looked at the available um, existing data, um, both from the USGS, um, which is the, the primary partner here, um, and looking at the flow statistics, uh, first of all, um, for annualized information, uh, this plot uh, generally shows uh, the percentage of time that a flow would be exceeded. So one way to think of this is if you look across to where the 50% is, that would be the average flow across the entire year. Or otherwise, looking at this table, that's 120 CFS. Um, other partners, um, Stantec had done a study in 2013 um, and had, you can see their results here, or an excerpt of their results. Um, and you can see that uh, they're reporting that same number. Um, and also they had provided a similar graph that was more narrowed to uh, the fish passage migration period. Um, so for the purpose of the study up until this point, we haven't really been focused on fish passage. We've been more looking at um, how the dams affect the hydrology and the hydraulics. So uh, we've been looking at larger flows, but uh, this is something that certainly going forward, we would be looking more at. The plot in the lower left is, uh, 
it's an interesting plot that they do. It's just uh, from the USGS, it shows uh, the discharges across time this way, and then the dates this way. So each pixel is a day and corresponds to this legend. So you can see there's more flows in the spring and it gets dry through late summer. And finally, on the lower right, you can see the FEMA flood uh, insurance study information um, uh, along with 100 year discharge. Okay, um, as I had mentioned, there are uh, several other studies that have been done. Uh, we have benefited from this wealth of information. Um, I'm not going to go through all of these. <clears throat> Excuse me. But uh, I would say that the uh, some of them have been extremely informative um, and we have uh, leveraged their information where it is possible and practical for us to do so. Okay, so getting more specifically into the hydraulics, uh, the, uh, uh, the base hydraulics for the Royal River are really formed uh, from the flood insurance study that was performed back in the 70s. Um, and this is still the effective regulatory model that FEMA uses. I had the uh, benefit uh, when I started my career, I had the benefit of working with engineers that could read these uh, these sheets of uh, computer output that were just numbers and be able to visualize uh, flooding. And they would literally draw the floodplains onto the old quad maps and reproduce them. So the computer program that was used and again, is still the effective regulatory model is HEC2 um, or HEC2. Um, that is an Army Corps product. It is currently uh, no longer supported, but it is the uh, predecessor of the modeling that we use today. Uh, this information is still good though uh, and relevant because uh, FEMA would send surveyors out at the locations of where you see these cross sections. And typically they wouldn't go all the way out to the extents of those cross sections, but they would survey the channels. And especially in areas like the Royal River where we have uh, high or relatively shallow bedrock um, or, and exposed ledge, uh, you know, some of those cross sections and survey information are still probably valid. Okay, so I mentioned the, um, the Stantec 2013 study. Um, they had created a hydraulic model um, that was generally based on the FEMA model and had updated it to the HEC RAS or the River Analysis System uh, model. And you can see screen captures of that here in the lower right. You can see those cross sections, those hydraulic cross sections. Um, and I should have mentioned the basis for this, uh, for this sort of modeling is one dimensional, meaning that there's an assumption that it's the same energy grade all the way across that cross section as the river is flowing downstream. And typically that's a fair assumption because rivers uh, uh, generally, if they're not too complex, uh, they're all flowing in the same direction. Uh, and the output from HECRAS, uh, from their modeling, you can see in the upper part of the image, where uh, in general, uh, the Bridge Street Dam is located about here, and the Elm Street Dam up here, and then you can see some railroad tracks. And then the extent of the model extended up to um, almost up to Baston Park. Okay, so, and I'll speed up because I realize that we're running short on time and I want to get to the demo here. 
So the next step of where we went is we have updated uh, the modeling to the current version of HECRAS, which is version 6.3.1. And we are looking to use, or we are using two-dimensional modeling. Uh, so what that basically does is it establishes a mesh for the system. And it then, <clears throat> at each one of the grid cells, it basically treats those as cross sections used to be treated. So it's using a, uh, it's using a uh, diffusion wave equation set, which is based on the mass uh, continuity equations. And at this point, I'm going to switch over and start showing off what that looks like. So uh, again, you can see the watershed uh, for the Royal River. And then I'm going to uh, switch over and show that. as the aerial view here. And our model reach or the domain that we analyzed starts down within uh, uh, on the Atlantic Ocean side of the harbor and then extends up to uh, extending up to uh, basically the boundary up to Route 9, uh, just a little bit past Route 9 uh, into uh, North Yarmouth. It's about nine miles, right, Tom? That's correct, yes. So one of the, and here you can see, as I zoom in a little bit closer, you can see these grid cells and how they are aligned and then the, the points, the computation points within the grid cells. Um, they don't need to be regular. Uh, they can have up to eight sides. Um, that's the, the basis for the modeling. The second thing that is really important is the terrain, though. Uh, so I want to spend a couple minutes talking about that. Uh, so the terrain sources that we used were the... Uh, Primarily the USGS one meter uh, 2020 DEM, uh, digital elevation model. Uh, however, that did not cover the entire area, um, especially uh, towards North Yarmouth. So we needed to merge that with a 2013 DEM as well. Um, and then, and I'll go through and show this, but we integrated surveys um, that were from some of the various studies, the Interflu uh, 2016 study, um, the TITCOM such its surveys of both the Bridge Street and Elm Street, and then also bathymetry that uh, we at the core collected recently um, back in the fall, just upstream of Elm Street Dam. There mm -hmm. was uh, the, for the survey dredge. Um, after that was completed in 2015. Uh, also, uh, there was <clears throat> bathymetry collected by Stantec in two 2013 uh, at East Elm Street. They collected it at uh, Bridge Street in 2009 and 10. And then, as I mentioned, there is the basis, the FEMA cross-section information where we don't have something better. Um, and finally, I went back through because there were areas that were excluded from the LIDAR, um, uh, that were excluded from the DM rather, of like uh, in-channel boulders and ledge that were still present in the LIDAR. Uh, so I extracted that from the, uh, the 2020 uh, USGS information. So let me start showing that to you. So You can see here some of the points that were from the dredge. In this area at the uh, 
at the interstate, the channel or the information is coming from the FEMA information plus the as-built drawings from the structure. Uh, you can kind of see that the channel is a little bit different here. Uh, through the lower falls, that's where I supplemented with LIDAR information uh, and also a little bit north of the lower falls. Unfortunately, we don't have very good bathymetry uh, in the reach between there and up to Bridge Street. So that's the FEMA information once again. You can see the LIDAR uh, showing the, the rock outcrops all the way up uh, to Bridge Street Dam, which is located here. Um, the points that are included here from the bathymetry upstream, I'm going to turn those off just so, for a second so you can see what this looks like. Um, and then also, as I mentioned, uh, you know, we had used those uh, surveys to locate and build the structures into this terrain. So you can see the bathymetry that we have going upstream. Turn back off so you can see how that changes. Upstream of the Bridge Street impoundment, uh, there's not really great bathymetry uh, through the Middle Falls area. Um, in fact, there's not very good resolution here at all, uh, but I did try to adopt the, uh, the LIDAR uh, points to help uh, provide some of that, um, that elevation change. Going further upstream, once again, using FEMA information uh, up towards the Elm Street impoundment, using that around uh, Gooch Island for, uh, for the channel, uh, the foundry channel. Um, here, let me turn, sorry. I assume that everybody's used to looking at uh, this uh, as terrain, but just for location. So we have foundry channel. Here is Elm Street. The Elm Street Dam is here. So you can see that uh, we have integrated the bathymetry through the impoundment. And then I'm going to zoom out and get really uh, high level here um, because that's really the, uh, where there's a lot of the exciting stuff is, but the river then continues up for, uh, as mentioned, about another five miles. Um, you can see the railroad tracks, railroads here, and I'm just going to zoom out to show you that we have bathymetry going up. To Route 9. And unfortunately, we do not have good bathymetry. I'll turn that back on. Unfortunately, we do not have good bathymetry uh, through this Oxbow area um, around Baston Park. Um, that's potentially something that could be improved upon um, later. So, um, going back to the slide deck. Uh, as mentioned, the structure information uh, that was built into the model was primarily done based on uh, as-built information um, and where we could find it. Um, Okay, and so, and then also, oh, wait for me a little bit. Uh, let me switch back to the model and start showing you some results. One thing to mention, and By Byron had alluded to this a moment ago, is that before we start looking at results, I want to caution you that these are draft results. They have not been through a QC process and are not finalized. So most likely they will change. Um, likely not significantly. And as Byron had mentioned, we feel that we're comfortable enough with them to go forward um, with the, what they are showing. 
Um, but one one area, as an example, if we were, you know, if we had time and all the budget in the world, what we would like to do would be to calibrate the model, and that is we would be looking at um, historic high water marks and then matching those up with the floods and the discharges that were measured at the USGS gauge, and then try to get the model to be calibrated, adjust the, uh, the roughness values, things like that, so that as we, we would be comfortable that the model was very tight, very, very tight. Um, Nat has been fantastic at uh, pulling uh, photos of different flood events. Um, here's uh, an example of one from 1989. Uh, and then you can see the same sort of uh, picture from today. <clears throat> One of the challenges we have, we can estimate, you know, about how high up that was, you know, close to the, the fire pit here. Um, the problem that we have is actually, if you look here in the left, um, the bridge is different. So that is going to affect the hydraulics. So there can be many nuances um, with high water marks. Uh, it's something that going forward, if there is a flood, you know, it, videos and uh, cell phone videos will certainly help. Um, okay, results without further ado. So I have a couple slides and then I'm going to go back into the model. Um, so first off, looking at the Bridge Street area, uh, these are plots of velocities. Um, but also, if you compare the footprint, that also shows you how the floodplain might change. So first off, uh, both of these images, the one on the left is with dams, the one on the right is without dams. They both have the same legend, so the coloration should be consistent between the two. You can see that there is a significant increase of velocity uh, through the bridge site itself, uh, uh, we're predicting after the removal of the dam. Um, and that's primarily due to the narrowing and the lowering of the floodplain through that area. Besides that, there is not evidence of increased velocity downstream or further upstream here. Uh, similarly, looking at the Elm Street Dam area for the 100-year event, the, um, there is changes, um, notably around the, uh, the Elm Street Dam itself. Now, in this case, um, there is still flow uh, for the 100-year event, there is still flow through the foundry channel. Um, that would not necessarily be the case for normal flow, uh, but for large events, uh, that would still occur. Okay, and uh, looking down at the lower falls uh, and at the interstate, um, here you can see that the images are almost identical. So we would not expect to see um, a scour concern, at least not an elevated scour concern, due to the removal of the dams here. <clears throat> so looking at how the elevation would change, uh, I looked at three different scenarios. Uh, the first is a very low 95% exceedance uh, flow. So this would be, say, you know, uh, September, uh, late September when it's very dry. The the way to look at this is the interstate is located about here. Bridge Street, the Bridge Street Dam is located here. Elm Street Dam is located here. Profile, oh, I'm sorry, Baston Park is up here at the end. You can see the vertical scale. Uh, these are in feet and ABD 88. The blue, darker blue profile is the without dam scenario, and the more uh, lighter blue is the with dams. So you can see that there is 
you know, approximately a uh, three foot difference around Bridge Street and about a four or five foot difference um, approximately going from Elm Street Dam pretty much up to Baston Park. There are areas, uh, the, the profile here does indicate there are areas within the channel where there has been, um, there are deeper locations, usually around bends, um, but then also sometimes are gravel deposits, uh, such as this location. Now looking at the, uh, something that's more of an average flow for uh, early March, uh, I had checked the, uh, the gauge earlier this week uh, and it was at 300 CFS, which is why I chose this number. Um, now, after the storm that we had, it's, it's higher. Uh, but you can see that under this sort of average flow scenario, there is still a significant drop uh, at Bridge Street, and a similar drop here at, that would be anticipated at the Elm Street. However, as that would progress further upstream, the additional discharge would start to control, and there would be less of a difference once we were up at Baston Park. Now, looking at the 100-year um, FEMA discharge, uh, which is 10,530 CFS. Uh, one thing to note is there is still a difference at Bridge Street. However, besides that, the, uh, the controlling terrain around East Elm Street will primarily uh, cause the profiles to be almost identical. So we do not see much of a drop if any at all. Um, and so this trend going from uh, low flows to average flows to the high flows with the amount of uh, difference decreasing as the flows increase. Okay. So to show you how that looks, and I'll try to do this quickly and get it back to you, Byron, here, because I respect everybody's time. Um, so looking at the, I'm just going to zoom downstream. Okay. And I'm going to show the existing my computer's getting a little laggy, so I appreciate your patience. So showing the how the flow profile would be through the lower falls and into the harbor for that one hundred year event. through Bridge Street. And we, we can certainly get into much more detail here. Um, one thing that we can also do is switch from depth to show the velocity. And we can also show water surfaces and then Uh, you can see that we can pull those values off and that the water surface does not necessarily need to be the same across the stream, such as how those 1D models would assume. Um, and then also, to point out that the trains themselves, as I mentioned earlier, have the dams within them for the non uh, for the dam removal scenario what we have done is actually removed that structure and we rerun it so there is 
there is a certain amount of uncertainty in these results because we are not sure exactly how um, the dams were actually notched into the bedrock. Um, so, and you can see that there's, you know, we have data up here, we have data down here, not so much data in between. These are yet to be uh, decided and will be developed going forward. Uh, with that, um, bathymetry and high watermarks are probably the greatest challenges um, that we have with uh, calibrating this model. However, um, I think that the results uh, speak for themselves. Uh, and with that, I'll pass it back to Byron. Yeah, thanks, Tom. Um, I just wanted to identify, recognize one of the things I mentioned earlier um, regarding sediment. So another thing that we would like, um, we've been talking with Nat and the town on getting some help um, with some additional probing data uh, above Elm Street. So we have a better understanding of what the substrate is like in that area to help us identify, um, further identify the volume of material um, behind Elm Street and that could be mobilized. So I, I know there's questions about sediment and the volume of material that could potentially be moved. And I will say that's 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 on the task, that's on the to-do list. Um, and I think we're, we need a little more information, I think, to be comfortable with those results too. So be patient with us uh, regarding that, that sediment volume question. Um, and that'll help us answer too, uh, how the alternatives would be actually constructed. You know, would we need to do some dredging before construction, um, et cetera. So those things need to be mapped out coming on down the line. Um, Tom, I don't know if you wanted to mention anything about the sediment piece. I know it's a hot, it's a hot issue, um, but we've been talking a lot about it. Um, there's a lot of good literature um, on the sediment piece that we're, you know, using to inform the study. Um, Tom, I don't know if you wanted to say a few words. I know the, the probing thing was one on the to-do list. Hopefully in the spring, Nat, when things are safe, we're trying to get folks to get out there and uh, collect that information. But So this is a 3D viewer that is uh, incorporated into HECRAS. And I think it helps show um, the bathymetry and that uh, at least to the extent that we have of both the terrain um, that's currently um, visible and then what we believe is behind the impoundment. Uh, so just for uh, orientation, uh, Elm Street, East Elm Street is located here. The dam is located here. And uh, I believe the, uh, uh, the art studio um, is shown here. Uh, or represented there. And so one example of uh, an unknown with the sediment uh, that we're, um, we would like to get is this mound right here. Um, because if you look, it's possible that that will block the flows from going this direction and might cause more of the flows to be going this this way around Gooch Island, um, just as one example. And I guess another concern is potentially this is all uh, uh, sediment that could be mobilized. Um, whereas, you know, another theory would be that since there's exposed bedrock here, that this is actually bedrock and would not be mobilized. Um, so these are, uh, this is information that it would be great to have. Um, yep, once that's it is just so. for the benefit of the, the folks on the line that that's, that's the perfect example of sort of a data gap that we want to fill here in short order to make good, you know, to make good planning, do a good planning analysis on, on future conditions and, and impacts of removing a dam from a sediment loading standpoint. Um, just to, before I get into the next steps too, uh, the other piece that we want to mention here, and it's in this kind of next next uh, steps list is the sediment analysis plan. So we recognize there's some sampling in the area before. There are some areas that we want to uh, 
do a little more uh, work on to fu fully quantify and categorize um, some of the contaminated uh, sediment that we see. It seems to be very small volume, um, but we still want to make sure that we're doing our due diligence here with identifying, properly identifying any uh, risks from a uh, contaminated uh, sediment standpoint. So that's on the list too. But second, for, but right off the gate, you know, I hope um, you can appreciate the work that Tom did put into this model. I mean, he pulled together many, many years of, uh, of, of, of kind of standalone efforts to pull, pull together the best possible product that he showed here today. So as mo noted, we're, 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 we're comfortable with the results from the flooding from the velocity standpoint. There are some additional areas that we'd need to do more work in, but in the bigger kind of continuum of the study timeline, I think we're where we, we wanted it. We were hoping to be to make some decisions about moving forward. So um, I'll work with Nat. I, I'm, we still have uh, that plenty of funding for the first phase one piece that we identified earlier in the study. So we'd like, we're planning on moving forward, I guess, until uh, unless told otherwise. Um, we want to pull together a full project delivery team. Much, much of the work right to date has just been done by, by Tom. Um, we need a full, fully developed project management plan, scope, schedule, budget. I mentioned the sediment analysis plan. Um, we're hoping to put that together and potentially do some additional work um, this calendar year. Um, and then also just as importantly, we know this is a high visibility study for a lot of folks in the community and the region. And we wanna establish a, a good communication plan with regular check-in so folks know what we're up to. And as we get deeper into it, there's a NEPA process that requires by law, federal and uh, 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 public and st state agency, resource agency involvement. So that that's another piece that will be uh, moving out on as well, moving forward. So I know we're a little over time. I think we've got about eight minutes left. Um, Nat, I, I don't know if you want to pull in the panelists or open it up for questions, we're happy to. And, and also we'll, there'll be a lot of follow-up from this as well, I assume. So um, if we can't get it all done in eight minutes, I, I, I understand, I understand that. I think you're on mute, Nat. Vincent cut me off, thank you. Uh, I'd be delighted if, uh, if any of the panelists have any follow-up questions or any hope to have any clarification of what was presented that would be terrific I, I'm not um, I'm not wedded to the eight minute mark but others may be is it uh, any of the uh, panelists would like to get some clarification from Tom or Byron on what you've seen so far if um yeah this is Matt I have a couple of questions now if that's okay so um, first of all, I want to commend the uh, Army Corps for taking on this study. Um, this is really important to get this model in place. You know, this is the sort of common language that we're all going to be speaking in um, moving forward. So it's, it's really great to, to see that and credit to them. Um, I did have a, a couple of questions about the model specifically. I wonder if you could clarify where the um, downstream boundary of the model exactly um, is. Good question. So I'm. Uh, I think I'm just going to show you. Um, but the the short answer is that it is approximately at the end of the Army Corps dredge limits. Okay. Roughly Parker Point for anybody who doesn't know where that is. Okay. All right. And um, since that's a uh, title, what sort of um, rating curve are you using at the downstream boundary? Is your model a uh, steady state or dynamic? And then also related to that, are you going to be looking at sea level rise scenarios given that you're tying into the tidewater? That's an that's an, those are all excellent questions. Um, so I'll try to go through those one by one. Um, the assumption for these results that I have been showing 
is that it is a constant zero foot NAVD 88 tailwater. Um, however, the model is hydrodynamic and is capable of modeling um, the tide or if we give the tidal signal to the model as a boundary condition, it will uh, change those water elevations. Um, so if the project team needs, let's say a, you know, FEMA hundred year storm, um, you know, we can reproduce uh, something similar to that. If we are looking for something that's more realistic, uh, we could try to mimic that. Um, or if let's say, there is uh, still concern about uh, velocity in this area, um, you know, and we would be looking at, you know, a scenario where, you know, perhaps as the storm is approaching, as a storm would be approaching, the water would be sucked out, uh, you know, due to the low pressure, um, and we would have a very low water in this area. We could do that as well, um, because that would, that could produce some high uh, velocities because the energy grade line uh, between first falls and the harbor would be the greatest at that point. Did those answer your questions, Matt? Yes, yeah, absolutely. Um, I have a few more, but I'll let some of the other panelists ask questions. <clears throat> if we have time, I can come back. Yeah, I'm, I'm curious actually at the other end of, of where you were talking about things. Um, you showed velocity profiles uh, through um, the core of uh, the structures in town. Um, over the last year or so, we've been reminded of thermal stratification occurring in the impoundment um, upstream. And so velocity profiles up throughout that impoundment um, might be relevant for uh, how stable some of that thermal stratification might be. Um, I'm wondering if um, you've seen uh, looking not just at elevations in that nine, nine miles of impoundment, but also looking at velocities, whether there's much of a change in anticipated velocities up there or not. That's an excellent question. Um, so I'll, I'm trying to get the, uh, my, my computer's bogging down a little bit right now, but uh, the short answer is I would anticipate that with higher flows like the 100 year event, the discharges are the velocities are going to be very similar, right? But for the more frequent events, that's where we, we are probably going to see more of a difference. Um, because of the fact that the water level is going to be lower, there's going to be less of a cross sectional area for that discharge. And so the velocities will need to uh, be higher. Now, if we're talking about very low flows, though, like that 35 CFS uh, scenario, the velocities are pretty similar because at that point, it's really just a trickle, right? So it, it is going to vary. My guess is we need to know a lot more about the, the physics of mixing in that system before we're going to be able to get much further down. But I just wanted to get a sense of how this might help us think that problem through long term. Thank you. Very helpful. So I'm assuming this is kind of an iterative process where, you know, one of the next steps is to look at the sediment transport <clears throat> and then, and then do you go back to this model after that, once all that sediment's been transported and, and look at all this again? So I guess I would start off saying that sediment transport, strictly doing sediment transport modeling um, has not been part of this. Uh, yeah. Conceptually, we would be able to, to do that. However, my understanding of the what the available data is so far is we might not have enough information to do true sediment, you know, mobile bed sediment modeling. Um, we I could be wrong. There might be better data out there. We might be able to draw on data from, you know, historic dredges, let's say, um, and samples. But yes, this platform would be capable and is capable of doing sediment transport modeling. And so um, 
likely this model would need to be tightened up, like I had mentioned before. Um, typically, the the model needs to be calibrated before you can model sediment transport and mobile bed. Otherwise, it's really just a guess, right? The uh, sediment modeling, ex I guess I should say, hydraulic modeling has about three parameters um, that are being solved for. Sediment modeling has closer to about 12. Um, and sediment transport modeling, especially with fixed bed or mobile bed. Um, and so I would be cautious um, to anticipate that we would be able to do true sediment modeling for this project. But I'm not an expert on that. There are experts at the core, and perhaps there is better data out there. Okay. Anyone else? Or want to take a second shot? I, I have one, and it has to do with a, a couple of things. One is um, I, I am interested in hearing more about that or exploring that whole sediment transport issue, because as you know, that's a very high concern for us, uh, volume and, and constituency. Um, <clears throat> one of the options, of course, is the do nothing model uh, option. And I'm wondering about sort of the structural engineering analysis that would go on in terms of assessing the conditions of the dams. Uh, how realistic is it for the town to, to think that we can keep the dams in place at, for forever? Uh, if that was the choice, uh, or what you know, what, what what are we going to face here? And I don't know if that's part of your study or not, but I hope that some some ground truthing for us of what does it mean to do nothing. Um, so I don't know if that's anything anybody can talk about as a future analysis. Or... Yeah, that's a good that's a good question, Nat. I mean, as part of an ecosystem restoration project, we generally wouldn't get into an in-depth structural assessment of a dam. I mean, that's a that's a big that's a big undertaking to do it per core standards. Um, that said, you know, these are old older you know pretty pretty basic construction. Um, you know, stone, stone dams, uh, low head as well. So I, I, you know, we, we should, we should talk about that if that's sort of a, a, a task that we want to add to the, to the, in, within the project management plan is what does that do nothing scenario actually look like? That's a, that's an interesting question. See, Matt has his hand up. Um, yeah, related to that question, I was curious, um, first of all, if you, I, you said the model wasn't yet calibrated to your satisfaction, um, but were you able to compare it with the existing FEMA um, model at all? Are they in pretty close alignment? They are. I'm afraid that my computer is not going to allow me to show you, um, okay. but uh, so I had uh, been showing, oh, maybe it will. Um, so what I, I have done is, um, a, as you probably are aware, uh, FEMA um, had gone through the effort of digitizing many of their maps. Um, and I believe in, in Yarmouth, um, there are preliminary maps that are being rolled out. Um, and uh, those preliminary maps uh, since they're digitized, I was able to pull the lines or the floodplain lines uh, into the model itself. Um, and in general, I think that they compare pretty well. Um, let me see, I might be able to. Uh, I don't think I'm going to be able to. It's too laggy. Um, but uh, yes, so uh, in FEMA's process, um, as they are updating and digitizing, they also redelineated on uh, the newer DEM. I don't think it was the 2020 data set. Um, I could be wrong there. Um, so it might not be a 100% match that we are using the same terrain that they did, but it is pretty close. And yeah, I'm afraid that I don't have an image of it in this here. You know what? 
you could hold on a second, I might be able to find an image to demonstrate. If I, if I could ask Byron a question while you're searching for that, yeah. and then we can jump back when you're ready. Um, obviously, we're very interested in sort of the next steps piece, and uh, I'm glad to hear your your thoughts about the communication plan because you know as much as we are worried about what could go wrong, we are very keen on finding out how we could move forward and when and and at what pace. And and you and I have shared and, and I know we've heard from yeah. unit members frustrations to date, which is a uh, you know, fact of life, but what can you tell me about uh, what the next steps will be or how we how we will get to the point where everybody can look at those together and maybe even have some input or comment on it? Uh, and the second part uh, would be about the communication plan. I'm sure people will be frustrated that, you know, we shut off the chat function and we didn't let them ask questions today because we needed to get this done. But I do want to make sure, and I know you and I have talked about it, um, that we find a, you know, an interactive forum capabilities when, we, when we're moving forward a little bit more. Uh, and I'd maybe I'd just invite you to speak on that if you could. Yeah, a couple of things. I guess first, I, if I'm sure there's folks out there who have emailed me in the past few months that I haven't responded to, and I apologize. I do my best to keep up with several hundred emails a day, and honestly, I, I fail most days to keep up. <laughs> I it's just a just a busy time at the core right now. I apologize for that. But yeah, moving forward, and I, I'd like to integrate that communication piece as part of the NEPA process because through the NEPA process, there's formal there's ways for folks to provide formal comment and concern for the record for the study that we must address. So as we roll out, develop this, this project management plan and, and figure out where those check-in points are with the public and with stakeholders to inform the formulation process, um, you know, we'd like to, we'll highlight those in the plan, communicate those. It sounds like the town, I mean, just this platform here, I look your websites, highly organized with the Zoom meetings and everything, we could keep this format going, um, you know, to communicate regular, regularly with folks and also provide um, ways for folks to provide formal comment on, uh, on the process. So um, does that answer your question? It, it does. I would, I would love to maybe press you on a, okay. Try to push on getting a time frame when we will have the next steps conversation and and uh, how detailed it will be at that point. Got you. So I'll push back on you too. <laughs> Fair enough. Is the town interested in moving forward with 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 the with the study then with uh, the next the next tasks and, and such. Well, I can't answer for the council, but I would venture a guess that. Yes, okay. they are very. That's very, what we're assuming. But I, I can get an answer to you on that pretty quickly. Okay, so that's that's sort of a big, a big, uh, a big uh, check-in point for us because if the answer is yes, uh, the study will get visibility at the district and get attention from uh, from the resource providers, and so we could build a, a pro an appropriate team. To, to do all the work needed for the study. So really we're at that we're at that point with getting the team together and I can't give you hard dates right now, but after this call we'll uh, we'll start getting things moving on our end to get that team together and to get that um, get these plans uh, communicated with you. Fair enough. One more push. Then if uh, you can't give me a hard date, can you give me a a, a range of possible dates are we talking a month or two or are we talking what yeah a months? month or two exactly I'm, I'm i'm hoping within a month we we have a a team put together here and a plan on our end to you know working on working on the project management plan so we'll be in touch uh, as you time. know that the town uh, was obligated to make sure we had the resources and a commitment to complete the project even though we also understand it's always the option to terminate at some point, but we couldn't go forward until we knew that we could be with you all the way to the finish line if that was the choice. So it's not a resource issue for us um, so much as is 
we've been waiting for the scope of services and the, and the data to move forward. So we appreciate getting this update, um, but you know, we're really keen on what's next. And I, I know the sediment sampling testing issue, uh, and I think the mobilization, to be frankly, uh, frank with you, uh, are gonna be you know, critical concerns. Absolutely, I, I agree. I will, I will ask one other question, uh, and it may maybe not be uh, just ready for this yet, is who does the assessment of how effective this will be in restoring fish passage and natural conditions. It's one thing to say, yeah, you could do it. And then the river will look like this and sure. the, the mitigation can happen to make sure nobody gets hurt. Uh, but but can, when do we find out whether it's worth the trouble? <laughs> put, put right, so we, we've, we've, we'll have a biologist uh, assigned on the team. Um, we, the district, we've got a lot of experience with fish passage projects throughout New England. Um, we built quite a few in Rhode Island and Massachusetts over the years. And we've done some dam removal projects as well. So we've got some great information, you know, historically in the district that, that we could take advantage of. So we will have experts on the team to look at this. And, and at some point, you know, this modeling will take a look at that fish passage piece too, right? We want to make sure that we have to identify target species and, and timing and flows and make, and, and make, get some assurances that, Removing the dams could actually will encourage and allow fish passage, uh, which we assume was the case in a historical condition before, before uh, you know, impoundments were built on the system. We we assume that much of that watershed was was taken advantage of as a, you know, uh, uh, spawning grounds for for Najimish fish. So, good question. That we we didn't really touch upon that piece at all in this presentation, but obviously that's sort of the whole, so what? Like that's the reason why we would justify the action would be to, for the benefit of that aquatic restoration component. I see, Matt, do you have a question? Um, yeah, just a, a recommendation going forward, going back to the hydrology piece, um, especially given that the FEMA, the FEMA um, you know, floods, the 10, 10 year, 50 year, 100 year and 500 year were probably determined back in the 70s. Um, so what NOAA always recommends is that you go back and if you have a long record like you do on the Royal River, which is great, we would tend to put more emphasis on the recent years. So sort of post 1970, because around 1970, we saw a real inflection point sort of in climate and flows. Um, in the in the northeast um so i'd recommend doing that i think everybody who's uh you know lived in yarmouth for a long time knows that the the weather the climate is is been different over time um and so maybe look at that model i know the u.s geological survey has looked at a lot of long-term stream gauges in maine and has actually done assessments on whether or not in some of these watersheds we're seeing higher flows more frequently I don't really know without looking at that if that's um, a dynamic that's occurred on the Royal River, but I'd recommend looking at that because, you know, most other places in the Northeast, we're just seeing higher flows more frequently. Um, and that goes to like, if you're tying into sea level rise um, at the downstream boundary of the model, also look at some of the future sea level rise uh, projections, like the one that the state is using in their main climate action plan. I would recommend doing that. Mm -hmm. And the point is, is that all of the infrastructure, the bridge, the federal channel, the dams, you know, were designed for yesterday's climate and we're in a different era today. So I think it's really important to understand the suitability of, you know, all of these structures, the floodplain and everything like that to handle the challenges of what we're going to be seeing in terms of the uh, amount of water and frequency of flooding in the future. Yeah, those are great points, Matt. Thank you. And, and I would just point out that by policy, the core, we are required to address the climate change impacts and, and analyze those fully in, in our study. Tom, I cut you off. 
No worries. I, and yeah, I was just going to concur. It's a, that is a fantastic question. And it is something that we will be looking at much deeper. Um, just for a 10,000 foot preview, um, the core does have a tool um, for looking at various scenarios. Um, this is just one uh, statistic. It's the annual maximum of mean monthly stream flow. So um, again, it's just one statistic, but you can see here is the period of record for um, the, the stream segment um, based on the USGS gauge. And then at least for this tool, it is not showing a drastic change uh, going forward. Um, and I believe this, uh, uh, the USGS study um, as well, you know, they varied based on, uh, you know, a range of temperatures and a range of potential precipitation changes um, and came up with a table of potential um, values here. I am not prepared to really speak on this in depth and there will be more to come. So that's just a preview. Okay, sounds good. Uh, following up also, um, Matt, on the question about the uh, the overlaying the FEMA floodplain. Um, I just, the only exhibit I have prepared um, uh, is just for the, the downtown area. Um, but the this is an overlay of those two. So the coloration is the 100 year, um, and I, I guess I should say this model, we can vary the flow. It's an unsteady flow model, but I am, uh, basically, I am just giving it one single flow and just keep that. Uh, so it's basically acting like a steady flow. That's that's why I quote it like this. But so the, the results are in this depth grid um, where it's uh, darker blue. It's where the deeper the water is. Um, the line work is from the FEMA maps. So starting on the inside, this black line that pretty much follows the deepest part of the river. That is the floodway. That's where FEMA has the highest restrictions. Um, then the next line out is the 100 year floodplain um, recognized by FEMA. You can see that it mostly matches um, down here um, in the harbor. It doesn't because I'm using zero foot elevation um, as the tailwater, but you know, I think there's this 12 or whatever the number is. Um, and then also the, in some places you will see a second line on this map. That is the FEMA 500 year elevation. So um, in areas where there's only one, that means that the FEMA 100 and 500 were too close to show differently. Um, so in this case, and in this area, um, you can see that our extents are a little bit wider um, for the 100 year than what FEMA has. So it's not a perfect match and it could be tightened up, but I think it's pretty close. Anyone else? Jump in with a question or a follow up. If not, then I think my follow up, it would be with Byron soon, probably in a week or so, I'll give you a call and see if we can start scheduling uh, an update of communications of some, some sort. And, and I, I know you know already that, uh, and are committed that we're gonna have a different kind of formats in the future, perhaps not, not every week, but uh, uh, so that the public can ask questions and be heard as well. But I thought it was important. We thought it was important after this amount of time that you get an opportunity to hear. And quite frankly, I needed the help of these other gentlemen to ask questions that I wouldn't, I wouldn't have the background to ask. So appreciate their help a lot. Absolutely, I appreciate the great questions. Uh, this is, a, I think, a good step in the good step forward today. Well, then, 
are we are we done for today and until the next time thank you very much i appreciate the opportunity to have worked on this and uh i'm looking forward to in in the future uh being able to continue supporting the town uh it's a it's a beautiful town and i i recognize the river is a main part of it Thank you much. Thank you, Matt, and Curtis, and Sean for your for your help. Tom and, and Byron, I really appreciate it. And thank you, Vincent, for helping make it happen for us. So we'll be in touch and uh, do something right. similar in the future. But thank you. Thanks, everybody. Have a great right. day. Thank you, you all. Patrick. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.